magnitude 7 earthquake struck the heart of Haiti, leaving the country in ruins. The quake took 160,000 lives and displaced more than 1.5 million people. Eight years later, and the country is still recovering from the natural disaster. But what if I told you that this wasn't a natural disaster, but it was a man-made disaster, a concrete disaster? It was because of poor construction, poor safety records, and cheap concrete that Haiti was devastated. It's easy to see why concrete is the most used building material in the world. It's made up of three components, an aggregate, water, and a binder. An aggregate can be fine, which is typically sand, or large and coarse, such as gravel, which fill up the majority of the concrete while the binder holds together the aggregate, the most common one being Portland cement. So cement is not the same as concrete. Concrete is essential to our lives and has become ubiquitous to modern buildings. And just after water, it's the second most consumed material in the world. Per year, three tons of concrete is consumed for every person in the world. However, the complexity of modern concrete had humble beginnings. Ancient Egyptians and Romans have relied on concrete to expand their empires. It was a key event of human evolution, and it allowed the construction of structures that would last for decades, for centuries. And since those times, concrete has been experimented with. Ancient mud bricks were found to have straw mixed in, and similar to fiber-reinforced concrete, today, short fiber strands are uniformly distributed and randomly oriented throughout the concrete. This additive can greatly change the properties of the concrete. And this is just the change that promises so much potential in the field of earthquake engineering. I will discuss how ductile concrete works, eco-friendly ductile cementitious composite, how it will benefit New Zealand, and the opportunities for manufacturing. Fibers are commonly used in concrete, making it, easy, making it a better product making it easier to set and dry. But that's not what makes it so important to earthquake engineering. It's when it's taken one step further to become ultra-high-performance fiber-reinforced concrete, or ductile concrete. Compared to fiber-reinforced concrete, ductile concrete has much more fibers and is much denser, allowing for ductile behavior. Ductility is when a material can be stretched and withstand a stress. So the name ductile concrete sounds quite oxymoronic. It's hard to imagine the usual Portland cement that lines our walls and pavements to be able to be stretched or flexed. But ductile concrete is different down to the molecular scale. Ductile concrete has a much denser packing. Between each concrete molecule, the empty spaces are removed so it can incorporate the fibers. And once the fibers are mixed in, these fibers hold together the concrete after it is cracked. In a simulated earthquake, the fiber-reinforced concrete beam performed much better than standard steel-reinforced beam. The fibers continued to hold together the concrete even after severe fracturing. This quality makes ductile concrete one of the leading areas of research in earthquake engineering. Researchers at the University of British Columbia have developed a new class of concrete, eco-friendly ductile cementitious composite. This concrete is a cracking development in the field. The, concrete, the quake resistant concrete is sprayed onto the object and uses synthetic fibers, which reinforces it. And it allows the bending instead of fracturing of the concrete. And it also exhibits strain hardening behavior. So when an earthquake hits, instead of the wall breaking and fracturing, the EDCC will start to bend the wall and distribute energy across it. EDCC uses synthetic fibers, which are made of polyvinyl alcohol and PET plastic, while only making up 2% of the whole volume. This gives the concrete that the fibers have a low elasticity, a high elasticity, and low density, allowing for an almost unbelievable elastic motion. Researchers conducted dynamic testing on cinder block walls. This is an unreinforced cinder block wall going through 65% the intensity of the Tohoku earthquake from Japan 2011. And now a wall is reinforced with 10 millimeter layer thick of EDCC to only one side and undergoes 200% percent 
of the 9.1 magnitude earthquake and withstands that. EDCC is designed to be applied to masonry. Masonry is a bunch of little pieces that are bound together by cement and sand. During an earthquake, masonry is very brittle and can collapse easily. With EDCC, though, the masonry becomes more ductile as it can bend. The EDCC distributes energy across the whole structure, allowing for the, for the earthquake to be distributed, uh, dissipated. However, uh, it is be already being used in Canadian elementary schools, and, it was, and a similar product called Flexus was used in New Zealand, but discontinued in 2015. However, there is a more urgent application in New Zealand. The 2011 Christchurch earthquake. Of the 189 deaths, 39 of them were from unreinforced masonry collapsing. Even though applying a 10 millimeter thick layer of EDCC might not be feasible, even a thin layer would have reduced the kinetic energy of the falling masonry. EDCC would have collapsed the masonry in many directions so the falling masonry wouldn't come down with as much energy, so they wouldn't travel as far. The concrete industry produces 7% of global carbon dioxide emissions. This is incredibly taxing on the environment. 180 kilograms of coal needs to be burnt to produce one ton of cement, in turn generating nearly a ton of CO2. Most ductile concretes use purely cement for its binder. However, EDCC is different, as only one third of its binder is composed of cement. This makes it much more sustainable and economically feasible compared to other ductile concretes. The remaining two thirds of the binder are made from a more sustainable alternative, fly ash. Fly ash is a byproduct of burning coal. Fly ash improves the workability, pumpability, and durability of the concrete. Uh, fly, ash, fly ash is uh, in EDCC the amount of fly ash is twice the amount compared to other ductile concretes. On a good day, a ductile concrete can have up to 35% as fly ash. Uh, a normal concrete can have up to 35% as fly ash. But EDCC doubles that, at nearly 70% being made of fly ash. By using fly ash, CO2 emissions can be reduced by up to 20%. And, and now researchers are looking into developing these fibers from recycled materials. Most ductile concretes use purely cement for its binder, which drive up the cost, and it has a high amount of this binder, and pollen cement is very expensive, making ductile concretes expensive. However, fly ash is half the cost of pollen cement, so the high volume of fly ash in EDCC makes it significantly cheaper. And the president of the University of British Columbia made a comment on the cheap cost of EDCC. This costs half of the cost of standard retrofit, the expenses were compared to, the to a Canadian elementary school, the cost of that. Common methods for, for seismic retrofitting is to knock down masonry and replace it, which is a very labour-intensive and expensive process. However, with EDCC, it doesn't need to be replaced, only applied to the masonry, making it significantly cheaper. A Manawatu town is at the threat of becoming a zombie highway. Seismic retrofits are hitting, are hitting these social places hard, and about 250 buildings in Wellington have been, have, been, have been listed to have unreinforced masonry facades. EDCC would see great use and optimal use on these facades, and would see much needed use. And not only that, within Wellington, there are many heritage buildings, and we do well to preserve them. To protect many methods to reinforce uh, heritage buildings are quite intrusive. There aren't many effective but unobtrusive methods. For example, the Philosophy, the Philosophy House of Wellington received a $50,000 grant from the Wellington City Council for seismic upgrade. EDCC would do well to reinforce that, as it only needs to be applied to one side of the wall, as seen in the dynamic testing, would, structure, would structurally benefit the building. 
and there's a potential for manufacturing of EDCC within New Zealand. Unlike Flexus, EDCC isn't patented or trademarked. It's more like a recipe for a cake mix. So EDCC can be developed, manufactured in New Zealand. It uses common components of concrete manufacturing. The large amounts of fly ash can be sourced from the Waikato power station, and just as private companies are already doing so in Whangarei. The super plasticizer and polyvinyl alcohol, which aren't manufactured in New Zealand, can be imported here, which are frequently done, while they also only make up 1% of the total volume, which is quite insignificant. And the major difference about EDCC production is only the, is only the mixing. The mixing is a more meticulous process which requires more work and time, more time and labour. This means that existing concrete factories in New Zealand could produce EDCC using the same machinery. But the most important thing about EDCC is that it saves lives. As oxymoronic as it sounds, investing in ductile concrete is not moronic. Instead, it'll become of the toolkit to build a safe and sustainable future for New Zealand. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Judges? Thanks, Danny. Um, did you say a similar product was made in New Zealand but discontinued? Why? Uh, because a lot of their ingredients were imported, so their fibres were imported from Japan, and it also used a large amount of cement as its binder. But EDCC uses way more fly ash, making it a lot cheaper. So why, why, didn't, why, didn't, why didn't we carry on with it? I was probably, they didn't publish the reason, but I can speculate that the cost was too expensive, so the net profit wasn't enough. Did you say in connection with Christchurch that buildings would still have fallen in that Christchurch quake even if they'd been coated with EDCC? Oh, sorry, I would have. Uh, yes, they would have still fallen if a thin layer was applied. But the, the kinetic energy of the falling masonry, uh, the reduced energy, would mean that it wouldn't travel as far, so it wouldn't travel onto roads or further into the streets. So how would it pr protect the aesthetic of heritage buildings if they're still going to fall over? Well, that's only a thin layer. I was just making... Um, so you put a thicker layer? Yeah, you put a 10 millimetre layer, and that'll definitely... Hold them work. up. Yeah. And you'd put it on the inside the as inside. opposed to the outside? Yeah, and you can plaster it over so it protects the aesthetic. All right. Um, but we still have the cost issues, presumably. Sorry? But we'd still have the cost issues of it that stopped us using it previously. Oh, well, this is a lot cheaper because the fibres can now be manufactured in New Zealand and the increased amount of fly ash makes it a lot cheaper, around 15% cheaper, but that's an approximate. And where do the fibres come from? Uh, they can be produced in New Zealand, uh, so the polyvinyl alcohol can be imported while the PET plastic can be made in New Zealand. You're, not, you're going to run out of fly ash, though, presumably, as the use of coal yes. disappears in New Zealand? Yeah, so in 2022... Um, they'll stop using coal. But there's still a lot of fly ash, and it's, it's just a waste of fly ash, and you need to repurpose that, and it's a really good opportunity to do so. And it doesn't take that much resources to produce EDCC. Thank you, Danny.